lecture. All right, thank you. So I've spoken about this material a number of times. And very often, I've had the experience that there is a number theorist in the audience. And the number theorist at the end says something like, that was great, but could you say it with more L functions? <laughs> and that's not really a language that comes naturally to me. So I, my answer is always, you know, probably, but I wouldn't know what to say off the top of my head. But when I was preparing the notes for this uh, winter school, I realized I was going to be talking to an audience consisting entirely of number theorists. So I should probably figure out how to say some of what I wanted to say using L functions. So uh, that's what I'm going to do in this lecture. Uh, but with the caveat that the L functions are actually irrelevant, the only thing that I'm actually going to do with L functions is evaluate them at s equals 0. But uh, nevertheless. So maybe this audience doesn't consist entirely of number theorists. So let me start just by reviewing uh, a little bit about what L functions are. So my setting x is going to be an algebraic variety defined over a finite field fq. What's that? It's blurry. it's blurry. Oh. What about this one? Oh, sorry. It was a technical issue. OK. All right. So let me remind you that uh, if you have an algebraic variety defined over fq, you can associate to it a function called it zeta function. Zeta of x, it's a function of a variable s. And what it is, it assigns uh, to s the product over all the closed points of your variety, 1 over 1 minus the size of the residue field at that point raised to the power minus s. So this is some generating function which contains information about the number of points that your variety has with values in various finite fields. It contains the same information as the number of points that x has with values in fq, fq squared, fq cubed, and so forth. And it packages this information in a, in a useful way. So, uh, and it's called the zeta function of x because you can write down more or less the same definition where x, instead of being an algebraic variety over fq, is instead the spectrum of z. And in that case, this would be the Riemann zeta function. OK, so the uh, zeta function of a variety over a finite field is a much simpler object than the classical Riemann zeta function. It's actually uh, something that you can write as a rational function in q to the minus s. So this maybe is definition one which is very concrete. Definition two, slightly less concrete, is that uh, zeta x of s is something that I'll write, well, it's a product over i greater than or equal to 0 of um, the determinant of 1 minus the Frobenius times uh, q to the minus s on the ith cohomology of x. And it's some kind of alternating product. Um, so this alternating products like this are going to appear a lot in this lecture. So I'm just going to give a name to this alternating product. I'm going to call this the determinant of 1 minus uh, phi times q to the minus s on the cohomology of, of x uh, with an inverse sign. So the equivalence of these two definitions is, is a form of the Grothendieck-Lefschetz trace formula that I mentioned earlier. 
Um, okay, so this is the zeta function of a variety. Um, I want to talk about a generalization of this, which uh, is like a, a zeta function with coefficients. So now let, let f be an l adic sheaf. on the variety x. So let me introduce some notation that I'm going to use when talking about l adic sheaves. So if I have a point, um, a closed point of my variety, I can think of it as giving me a map from the spectrum of a field into that variety, namely the residue field at that closed point. And I would like to refine that to a geometric point of my variety by choosing an algebraic closure of that finite field. And this composite map is something that I'll denote by x with a bar over it. So that's just a, a geometric point lying over the, uh, the actual point x of the underlying topological space. Um, so then if f is an l uh sheaf, I can talk about its stock at the point um, x with the overline here. And this is just going to be a finite dimensional QL vector space. But because it comes to me, well, so this uh, QL vector space, you can think it's obtained by taking my sheaf f, which lives on x, first restricting it to the point x without the overline. That gives me an l adic sheaf on the spectrum of a finite field. And then restricting it to the spectrum of the algebraic closure of that finite field. At the intermediate stage, we see that um, we get some information, which is that this QL vector space has a canonical automorphism called the Frobenius map. And, well. It's the Frobenius map associated to the finite field kappa x. So I'm going to denote it by phi sub x. So this is some QL linear map. And now, um, so definition. One of the L function that's associated to this uh, chief, I'll write it as L of f comma s. Again, this is a function of uh, s being a complex number. And it's something that I can write as product over all the closed points of my variety of now um, the determinant of 1 minus the size of kappa x raised to the power s times the Frobenius at x on this fx bar. Uh, with an inverse there. So this is um, definition. Oh, maybe I should emphasize when I write that this is the definition. This is the definition provided that the real part of S is sufficiently large, which guarantees that this infinite product converges. And you can define it for almost all values of S. Um, then by, by analytically continuing, I mentioned earlier that uh, in the case of the zeta function, this turns out to be a rational function of q to the minus s. And the same thing is true for this L function, uh, because this is equivalent, again, by the Groth and Deke left jets trace formula to another definition. Let's call it definition 2, the L function of f evaluated at the point s is something that you can write as a product of, um, well, using my earlier convention, it's the determinant of 1 minus the Frobenius. Now that's the Frobenius on, uh, on associated to fq, uh, q to the minus s, on the uh, compactly supported cohomology of x bar. Um, but now you don't take the, cohomology with constant coefficients, you take cohomology with coefficients in this sheaf f. And so remember, this determinant really means an alternating product. So this is defined as the product over i greater than or equal to 0 of some determinant on hi uh, raised to the power minus 1 to the i plus 1. OK. So 
this is just a relative version of the zeta function. If you specialize to the case where f is the constant sheaf, just ql everywhere, then it recovers the zeta function of the variety x. OK, I'm going to need a slight generalization of this. I want to talk not about a single l adic sheaf, but a complex of l adic sheaves. So let db of x be the, well, the bounded derived category. of QL sheaves. So I'm going to use the letter F to denote a typical element of this bounded derived category. So um, it's, it's roughly speaking, you can think of these as, as chain complexes of l adic sheaves, although that's not quite right. Um, so these objects of this category have the property that you can associate to them. So for each integer i, um, you can associate what I'll write as, that's supposed to be a script h, the, the ith cohomology of f, but in the world of sheaves. So this is going to be an l adic sheaf on x in, in the sense of the previous uh, slide over there. And now uh, this symbol B indicates that I want to consider the bounded derived category, meaning that these cohomology sheaves, these vanish uh, for almost all I. Um, okay, and now given an object in this bounded derived category, you can also associate an L function. And you just do something stupid. So definition, um, here's what I mean by the L function of x with coefficients in f. Now where f is in the derived category, it's just an alternating product of um, the L functions of the cohomology sheaves of f. So, um, So that's a definition, and well, again, there are two versions. Let me just write them out so that we have them for later. Um, depending on whether I take definition one or definition two as my definition of a, the L function of an L adic sheaf, I get two different descriptions of what I mean by the L function of a complex. So uh, definition one is that the L function of f at the point s is a product over, um, well, closed points of my variety and integers i of um, determinant of 1 minus the size of the residue field. Sorry, I just realized this isn't going to be big enough. Phi sub x restricted to what I should put in there is the stock of hi of f taken at a geometric point lying over x. Um, so that's sort of concrete definition that doesn't require thinking about cohomology. Um, so that's version one, but it also, it's also something that we can write by thinking not about the stocks of this sheaf, but instead about the cohomology of that sheaf. So L of f comma s can also be written as, um, let's call it the determinant of 1 minus the Frobenius times q to the minus s on, I'll again write it as h star of x with coefficients in f. Um, but now this f is a complex now, so when I talk about the cohomology, it's what's sometimes called the hypercohomology. x bar with coefficients in f. And again, the equivalence of these two definitions follows from the Groth and Dieck-Lefschetz trace formula. OK, so I would like to cook up an L function that is relevant to the situation that I've been talking about in this series of lectures. So I'm actually going to 
describe, well, I'm going I'm to assert the existence of certain objects which are relevant to this story. So claim. So let, uh, well, I, I won't make the claim yet. So first, some setup. So let x be a variety. Actually, well, let me, let me start by just recalling something that we said in the previous lecture. So uh, recall, so if y is a, uh, a variety or a stack defined over a finite field k, And in the previous lecture, I made some assumptions about the y that I was interested in. I, I assumed that uh, h1 of y bar with z mod l coefficients was, was 0, and that hi of y bar with z mod l coefficients is finite for all i. And, well, I should probably say this for h0 also vanishes, so y is, uh, can, oh, I said it was a variety. Well, I'll emphasize it by saying it's geometrically connected. So under these assumptions, in the previous lecture, I talked about uh, assigning to y bar what's called its L-adic homotopy type, and in particular, its L-adic uh, homotopy groups. So then we have, um, L-adic homotopy groups, which in the previous lecture um, I denoted by pi n of y bar with QL coefficients. So these are finite dimensional vector spaces over QL. And moreover, if, since I they're defined just in terms of y bar, but if I know y bar comes from some y which is defined over a finite field, then these finite dimensional vector spaces have a canonical automorphism coming from the Frobenius of the ground field. So let's just say with a Frobenius. So this is the story that I told in the previous lecture, and what I would like to do now is a relative version of this. I want to think about this not for a single variety y, but I want to imagine that I have a family of y's parametrized by uh, some other variety x. So, so here's the relative version that I would like to contemplate. So x, as before, is going to be some variety over fq. And this is ultimately going to be the algebraic curve from the second lecture. And now let y be some, uh, could be an algebraic variety, but more likely it's going to be an algebraic stack mapping to x. And uh, I'm going to assume that this map is smooth. And now for, uh, for each closed point of x, I'm going to write y x bar to mean what you get when you take y and cross it over x with that, that geometric point x bar that I mentioned earlier. Um, so then this y x bar is some uh, smooth stack which is defined over the algebraic closure of a finite field. And potentially, um, it's something that you could apply this story to. So now, in order for the, everything to work nicely, I need to make a lot of assumptions about how nice y is. So I'm going to assume that each uh, y x bar, uh, well, has vanishing h1 with zl coefficients. I'm going to assume that it has finite hi with zl coefficients. and Moreover, I want to put myself in a situation where these L-adic homotopy groups live in finitely many degrees. And so I'll say also have vanishing uh, pi n with QL coefficients. 
for n sufficiently large. And that, moreover, I should be able, I want to assume that this is true uniformly, meaning the n, I can choose my n so that it works for all the points x of my, uh, my variety. So the claim is that, now I'll make the claim. The claim is that in this situation, I can define a relative version of these L-adic homotopy groups of Y. So that there exists an object, which I'm going to write as F sub Y over X. And what sort of an object is this? Well, it's something that lives in this bounded derived category of L-adic sheaves on X um, with the following features. All right, so the, the, the main feature is that it, it is a relative version of these L-adic or uh, homotopy groups in the following sense. So for each closed point of X, well, I can take, uh, that's a script H, I can take the ith cohomology sheaf of F. So this is now an L-adic sheaf on my variety X. It's something where I can take the stalk at a geometric point, and when I take the stalk at a geometric point, I'm supposed to get a finite dimensional vector space over QL. And what I want is that for that to be the minus ith homotopy group of the fiber. And of course, I've said it in a way that maybe looks a little weird. Uh, this is not interesting if I is positive. This, this is interesting if I is negative. So the cohomology sheaves of F will be concentrated in negative degrees. Maybe I should write it like this. Um, so this is for all I. So this is one feature that uh, this construction should have. Another feature is that uh, it is functorial. In, in Y, what I mean is that if I have some X and I have Y mapping to X and some other Y prime mapping to X, Y prime mapping to Y such that this diagram commutes, this gives a, a map from F Y prime over X to F Y over X in this bounded derived category of X. So this is supposed to be some, uh, a map which when you pass to stalks and cohomology, it induces the map on homotopy groups given by the map from Y prime into Y. So I, I wanna say that these uh, sheaves F Y over X, it's some global version of taking the homo L-adic homotopy groups of the stalks and the functoriality is some global version of the fact that the uh, L-adic homotopy groups are a functor of a uh, scheme Y. And I also want to say that it is functorial in X. In the following sense, so let's suppose that I have some Y mapping to X, satisfying these nice conditions, and I have some X prime mapping to X, and then I form the pullback. Y prime is Y cross over X with X prime. Then in that case, so let me call this map from X prime to X, little f. So in that case, what I wanna say is that the sheaf that I'm going to assign to Y prime over X prime, this lives in the bounded derived category of X prime, this should just be the pullback of the sheaf that I assigned to Y over X. And again, this is how things ought to work based on the first assertion that I've made, which is that the, uh, these sheaves have the property that when you compute, take their stocks, they're just computing the homotopy groups of the fibers. If you have a pullback diagram here, it means the fibers of this vertical map on the right are the same as the fibers of this vertical map on the left, and therefore they'll have the same L-adic homotopy groups. And I'm just saying that should be true, not just on stocks, but globally. Okay, so I haven't defined for you these sheaves, but um, I'll say something about the definition at the end. 
but let's just believe for most of this lecture that there is a natural construction with the features that I've described. So I want to use it. So let's go back to our situation that we're really interested in, where x is an algebraic curve over fq. And now remember that for when studying Vey's conjecture, we were interested in having a group scheme over x. So g is going to be a group scheme, which I'm going to assume is smooth, affine, um, the fibers are connected, and well, and the generic fiber should be semi-simple and simply connected. This is just the setup that we had in lecture two, except in, in lecture two, I think I forgot to tell you the properties that I wanted my integral model to have. I wanted my integral model to have these properties. Anyway, this. Given any algeb linear algebraic group defined over the generic fiber, um, you can always find an integral model of it which has these properties that I've listed here. And if you started with a group over the generic point which was semi-simple and simply connected, then of course it will also satisfy this, uh, this last condition. Okay, so in this situation, I would like to apply um, what I've been saying over here, but not to the map from G to X. Instead, I would like to take the classifying stack of G. So G is a group scheme over X. I can take its classifying stack that's taken in the world of algebraic stacks with a map to X. So to emphasize that this is an object that lives over X, I'm going to call it BG sub capital X. This is an object mapping to X. It's a stack, and it can be described as follows. Um, if R is any ring, then maps from spec R into this object that I'm calling BG sub X should be the same data as maps from spec R into the curve X itself plus a G bundle on spec R. And here G is a group that lives over X, and therefore it makes sense to talk about a G bundle on spec R whenever spec R maps into X. Okay, so this BG sub X is an example of the uh, kind of thing that I can take Y to be. What did I tell you I wanted to know about Y? I wanted to know that it was a, something with a smooth map to X that's satisfied by this BG sub X. I wanted to know that all of the geometric fibers uh, looked like they were simply connected with uh, vanishing, or simply connected with finite dimensional cohomology and finitely many homotopy groups. And in this case, the geometric fibers, as we, or as I asserted last time, they're classifying spaces of linear algebraic groups. Their cohomology rings look like polynomial rings on generators of even degree. So they're things for which the L-adic homotopy groups are, are very simple to, have a simple description in terms of a tall cohomology. So we're in the setup. I'm about to run out of paper. Um, so we're in the situation to which we can apply this construction that I asserted the existence of. So we get a sheaf which I'm going to call F sub BG sub X so over X. So this is something that lives in the, the derived category of X. And then to this sheaf, we can associate an L function. L F sub B G sub X over X coefficients in F. That's a little wordy, so why don't I come up with a notation for it? I'll just call it L sub B G sub X uh, S. Okay, so what can we say about this L function? 
Well, I would like to first just write down what its values are. So we have two formulas for uh, how to evaluate an L function. So let me use the first of those formulas now. So by definition one, what is this L B G sub X comma S? It's given by the product over the closed points of X. I'm then supposed to take um, the determinant of one minus the size of kappa x to the power s, uh, power minus s, um, times the Frobenius at the point x on the uh, this sheaf L B G sub x over x. I take its stock at a geometric point, and then I put an inverse there. Okay, but we know what these stocks are, right? The defining property of this sheaf is that I know its stocks at geometric points should be computing the homotopy groups of the fiber. So this is a product over the points of x of the determinant of 1 minus kappa x to the minus s phi sub x evaluated on the um, determinant of that acting on the homotopy groups of the, well, let's call it BG sub X bar. And now, this was something that appeared in the previous lecture, at least in the special case where S is equal to zero. So let's put in S equals zero. L sub BG sub X comma zero by Steinberg's formula. When S equals zero, we're just computing the determinant of one minus Frobenius on the cohomology, or sorry, on the, uh, the homotopy groups of the classifying stack of a linear algebraic group. And, well, by what we said before, this should be L, the number of points of BG with values in the residue field of X divided by um, the size of that residue field to the power dimension of BG, or, well, that, that's a little bit of a strange way to write it. Um, a more concrete way of writing it is to say that it's the size of the residue field raised to the power equal to the dimension of G divided by the size of the finite group G of kappa X. Oh, sorry, and there's a product over all x and x. And you might recognize this product. It's one side of the mass formula. So what's the upshot? Sorry? Can I jump the page? Adjust. Adjust. Like that. So what's L B G sub X at zero? Um, well, if I use definition one of L function, the one that's given by taking a product over stocks, this is equal to the, uh, the right-hand side of the mass formula. Um, it, for appearing in Bayes' conjecture for G. Now, as you might guess, we're going to try to get some mileage out of seeing what description two of this L function buys you. So description two says we shouldn't look at the stocks of this sheaf um, F, B, G sub X. We should instead try to think about the cohomology of this sheaf F, B, G sub X. And I want to relate that to the moduli stack of G bundles on X. So what's the relationship? So there's a relationship between um, this stack BG sub X, which lives over X, and this moduli stack bungee X, which lives over a point, spec FQ. So what is the relationship? 
Well, it's that if I take x cross bungee x, there's a natural map to bgx. And this is all over x. Right? What are the points of the left-hand side? To give an r-valued point of that product x cross bungee x, I have to specify an r-valued point of the curve together with a G bundle on um, X cross spec R. On the other hand, BG sub X, to give an R valued point, I have to give an R valued point of my curve together with a G bundle, but not on the entire curve, just at that point. And so this is given by just restricting G bundles to a point. So what does this buy me? Well, if you believe that the construction that I gave earlier is functorial in the, in the ways that I said it was, it, it, it will connect something about bungee to something about BG. So this induces a map from, um, let's say, the sheaf that I want to associate to x cross bungee x over x to this f of bgx relative to x. On the other hand, um, in this situation over here, I have a pullback square. Sorry, I was told not to do this, but I apologize to people on the internet. Um, I have a pullback square which tells me how to describe this sheaf um, f x cross bungee relative to x. So let me call the projection map, let f be the projection map from x to a point. This is the pullback of um, just f of bungee x relative to, to f q. Okay, so there's this map from a pullback of a sheaf that lives on spec FQ to this sheaf on X that is the one that I'm actually interested in. And let me just think of that a different way. Let me think of it not as a map from a pullback to something, but as a map from something to a push forward. So this is the same thing as giving a map now in the world of sheaves on spec FQ from the one that I'm going to associate to bungee X to, um, well, I'm pushing forward in the derived category, so I'll write that as RF lower star of F sub BGX relative to X. And now, here's the theorem. Joint work with Dennis Gates, Corey. Um, let's call this map something, let's call it theta. Theta is an isomorphism. So this is a, a sort of local to global principle that describes the L-adic homotopy type of bungee X. And it's, it's a one way of making precise this heuristic idea that the cohomology of bungee X should be a continuous tensor product of the cohomologies of the uh, BG at various points. So I'll elaborate that on that a little bit more in the next lecture. Uh, but let's just see what it buys us. So assume this. Well, I'm saying that something is an isomorphism in the derived category, and it's the derived category of l adic sheaves just on a point. So that's really just a concrete statement about, um, you can think of these that's equivalent to saying that this induces uh, an isomorphism on cohomology sheaves when you take the stock at the unique, essentially unique geometric point of spec FQ. So what is this saying concretely? Well, if you take the, what this is saying is that you get an isomorphism of QL vector spaces. If you take the ith on the left hand side, what you would be seeing are the, the homotopy groups of bungee x with QL coefficients. 
And on the right-hand side, what you would be seeing are the cohomology groups, um, hypercohomology groups, I should say, of x. Um, well, I should put a bar on it. X bar with coefficients in this f uh, bgx relative to x. OK, so what is this bias? Well, let's use our second description of the L function that we've associated to this situation. So this L, what did I call it, BG sub X, comma S, this is equal by invoking definition two to the trace, or sorry, the determinant of one minus Q to the minus S, the Frobenius on the uh, H star, of x bar with coefficients in this sheaf, bg x over x, and then an inverse there. And by, if you assume this theorem, which describes what those uh, hypercohomology groups look like, what you're seeing is the determinant of 1 minus uh, q to the minus s phi on the homotopy groups of the moduli stack of G bundles. I should, I should put a bar there. And then when I evaluate that at zero, what I'm just seeing is the same thing now without the q to the s factor, just the determinant of 1 minus phi on the homotopy groups of bun gx, ql. And this is equal by the analysis that we did last time. Well. If you assume that bun gx satisfies the growth and deke left trace formula and that everything converges, this, by what we said last time, is the number of fq points of bun gx divided by um, q to the dimension of bun gx. In other words, this is equal to the left-hand side of um, the mass formula. version of Bayes' conjecture. So what's the upshot of this? Well, you get a proof of Bayes' conjecture, a conclusion, um, theorem, let me label it, theorem A implies Bayes' conjecture. Okay, so why is that progress towards proving Bayes' conjecture? Um, what can you say about theorem A? So theorem, Bayes' conjecture is a statement about numbers, right? If, when you phrase it as a mass formula, you're saying you have some number on the left-hand side, some number on the right-hand side. They're defined in different ways, but they're equal as complex numbers. And uh, this is not a theorem about numbers. It's really a theorem about vector spaces. It's a vector spaces over QL. It's a, uh, and it's a statement not that things are equal, but that some map is an isomorphism. So, and it's also a geometric statement. So note that theorem A does not um, reference the field FQ. It's really a statement not about why well, it's a statement that you could make sense of um, for any group scheme G over any algebraic curve over any field. And if you want to prove it, it, it doesn't matter what the field is. You're free to enlarge the field if you want to. So it's a, it is geometric in the sense that um, you can check it by replacing FQ by its algebraic closure. So it's, it's a statement about algebraic curves over algebraically, an algebraically closed field. And moreover, over the complex numbers, it reduces to something familiar. So um, over C, well, let's say it, it follows from 
the fact that, uh, how should I say it, um, that algebraic G bundles and B bundles on X are um, classified, well, it follows from, why don't I say it like this, that Bungie X, which is something which classifies algebraic G bundles on X, is also a classifying object for topological G bundles on X. In other words, it, it follows from the fact that uh, complex analytically, for G bundles on a curve, uh, G bundles satisfy an H principle. That is, if you try to understand the moduli space of G bundles in some complex analytic sense, it ends up being uh, homotopy equivalent to the object that classifies G bundles in the purely topological world, which you can actually compute topological invariance of, like homotopy and cohomology. And the difficulty is then to make sense of that H principle in algebraic geometry. Or I guess I have made sense of it by stating theorem A, but to prove that that H principle is also true in algebraic geometry. All right, how long do I have left? Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, so why don't I say, um, so next time I'm going to, sketch some ideas that go into the proof of theorem A. Um, but there's a theorem that goes into this conclusion, but there's also a definition that goes into this conclusion. So I want to end this lecture by just saying a few words about this construction of um, a more basic question then how do you prove a theorem is how do you define the objects that are appearing in the statement of that theorem? So question how to define this sheaf f y over x in db of x and for example if what if y, the main case that we're interested in is when y is the classifying stack of a linear algebraic group or a group scheme over x. So let me, a related question is how classical an object is this? So this is very closely related to an object which appears in the literature. Um, well, for example, in Steinberg's work, and there's a paper of Dick Gross about the motive of an algebraic group, this is sort of a variant of that object. So let's talk about um, a simple case. So an easy case would be, what if G is everywhere semi-simple? It has good reduction at all points of the curve. So now, this F sub Y over X it's supposed to be some object in the derived category, but when I take a cohomology sheaf of it, it's supposed to have the property that um, it's computing for me the homotopy groups of of the classifying stack of a certain linear algebraic group. So this kind of tells you what this cohomology sheaf should look like at the generic point of X. So to describe an l adic sheaf on X, what do you need to do? Well, first, you need to describe what it looks like at the generic point. And that should just be some finite dimensional QL vector space with an action of some large Galois group. So um, let's say at the generic point, what we're seeing is um, the homotope, well, the ith homotopy group of, let, I'll call it BG eta, or what was in my second lecture was G0, the generic fiber of this group scheme. And, well, you then take its classifying stack over an algebraic closure of the generic point of your curve, and then you think of it as acted on by the absolute Galois group of the uh, function field that you're interested in studying. So this homotopy group, it's a classical object. Remember, 
it has another description in this case. The homotopy groups are just dual to I mod I squared, where uh, I is the maximal ideal inside the cohomology ring of this classifying stack. So this, this object is classical. It's easy to describe. And I'll just conclude with a few more remarks. So you see some Galois representation that you can define concretely. And the assumption that G has good reduction everywhere um, guarantees that this sheaf H minus I of F is actually lease. It's something you should think of as a local system. That means that this Galois representation is unramified. Um, this representation is unramified and defines a sheaf, let's call it F sub I on X. A sheaf, L attic sheaf in the usual abelian category of L attic sheaves. So an idea that you might have is at least in the good reduction case, you could define, try to define this object that I'm describing in the derived category, bg sub x over x, as a sum of, well, we know what each cohomology sheaf should look like. Um, what its minus ith cohomology sheaf should look like this sheaf fi, and so just put that in uh, cohomological degree minus i and add it up. And in the good reduction case, I think this is actually correct at the level of objects, that, um, that the uh, object of the derived category you produce is a sum of its cohomology sheaves. But even though this is good at the level of objects, it's bad as a definition. Because if you try to make this your definition and then try to write down some maps that you get from functoriality, this theorem A that I stated will not be true. In order to give a definition which is functorial in a sense that makes theorem A true, you have to do something smarter than this. Uh, but since I'm out of time now, I'll just say that in order to give a good definition, you need to use some ideas of homotopy theory which I will not elaborate on right now. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a construction, which I didn't explain in the lecture. I mean, it's, it's something which comes out of a construction. And theorem A is not just a, it's a statement about that construction. Um, so may, maybe I should elaborate more on this idea. So if you were to make this your definition, you would produce something that has the same L function as the, uh, the sheaf that I'm actually talking about. So. It's just as good for the purpose of counting points, but it's not good for um, reducing questions about counting points to geometric questions about cohomology groups. It will, this definition will, uh, will not let you prove something like theorem A. So, um, it so in general, can you uh, define, well, have to expect a, a functional equation for um, L functions for, that, for like, for example, sheaves uh, like F on a, on a stack? Because uh, you have an L function, um, you, you just naturally expect to have a functional equation, I guess. Right? Well, I mean, any, oh, oh, functional. Well, these, uh, I mean, if, if fun functional equations for, L functions are supposed to reflect some kind of duality between the uh, L attic sheaves that you use to produce them. I mean, I think the, the thing you're putting in to this construction is an L attic sheaf that isn't really self-dual. So it's, um, 
So, yeah, I don't know what to Okay, uh, maybe in view of the time, uh, we'll have to end there. So let's thank, uh, thank Jacob again. Thanks.